Hello, I'm Joseph Malazzi, creator of Dark Matter, and you are listening to Neil Before Pod. Neil Before Blog presents Neil Before Pod. Hello, and welcome to the rarely heard but always enjoyed Neil Before Pod interview segment. I'm your host Craig McKenzie, and before we begin, I'll play you a short clip of the man joining me today. You, Angel, wipe their memories. <gasps> US government plates, elite dog catcher level. Someone special wants you. Whose hydrant have you lads been tinkling on? I'm sorry, who the hell are you? Oh, where are my manners? Arthur Ketch, British Men of Letters. With me on this episode, I have David Hayden-Jones, who's recently uh, started a guest spot in Supernatural. Hi, David. Hello, Craig. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Excellent. Thank you, mate. Thanks for coming on. My pleasure. Right, so I guess... The first thing we should do is establish a little bit about yourself. You know, where did you grow up and what got you into acting? How did you get to where you are today? Yeah, so um, I'll give you the brief notes. It's sort of a bit of a hodgepodge. Um, So dad's a North Whalian, mom born in Texas. They met in London, uh, started a family, and then immigrated to Canada, the middle of nowhere Canada. And so I sort of grew up in a very British uh, household in the middle of the prairies of the Commonwealth (laughs) of Canada (laughs) and um, sort of traveled all over the world, really, from UK to um, America and Canada and back. And then uh, sort of started doing plays, really, uh, community theater. And my mom and dad were very active in the arts and dance and music and theater and sort of it just sort of by osmosis got into me so you've uh, had the acting bug bit you from an early age then yeah age six unfortunately and i've been (laughs) in recovery ever since in recovery ever since yeah i see from your imdb page you've done a few comedy type shows particularly rumors and deborah which you had quite a big role on um what's it like being on comedies as opposed to say drama i mean i know that most drama has its comedic elements anyway so i suppose that'll give you a leg up on that but yeah sure um well, I my I really fell in love with uh, comedy. I used I was a huge Python fan, and then another Canadian show, which a lot of great Canadian comedians called SCTV. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it over there. I've heard the name, yeah. Yeah, but uh, so those are my two comedy influences, and then I did sketch and improv in university, and um, so then that led me to sort of that started my career. I gave myself a career through uh, doing comedy in the clubs, and. I think the best comedy is always comedy that's rooted in truth. Um, And especially with the aesthetic of sort of after uh, Gervais did the office, sort of Mm. that really verite style comedy and what happened over here. Of course we had the American office and then parks and rec and then, and modern family, which is a show I worked on. And so it's comedy, it's absurdness, but rooted in reality. And I think that's sort of the best aesthetic right now. Um, I do definitely like the broad and absurd sort of sketch comedy of yesteryear, but I'm sort of, I'm moving my aesthetic towards that sort of verite style, grounded absurdism. Is there any major differences really? I mean, is, you know, obviously you, the acting is, is different and you have to get kind of timing slightly differently, but is there yeah, anything? No, absolutely. absolutely. Well, uh, comedy is about rhythm and literally sometimes it can just be a technical note. Sometimes it's funny if it's faster. Hmm. You have more air in drama to sort of take your beats and your moments and to really uh, have the thoughts. But comedy really, uh, it, it really is rhythmic. It's like music and sort of it's like, but, 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 you know, it, it, it yeah. sort of, you have to understand the music and rhythm of comedy and how much the gap is too long and when it's too short for the punchline. Hmm. So it's kind of a slightly different skill set in terms of how you... Yeah, and I really think the only way you can really do comedy well is to do it 
in front of in either in theater or in the clubs at some point because that is the absolute quickest way to know whether something's funny or not. It's pure democracy, right? Because if you <laughs> do a joke, you tell a line in a club and it's crickets, <laughs> you're like, well, that's not funny. You're like, you're, it's, there's no mystery, right? Whereas yeah. you're doing this drama, dramatic, uh, you know, angst ridden play, you wouldn't really, really know whether people are sort of believing you or not believing you until, you know, heard them talking outside or whatever. But with comedy, you're like, that worked. It didn't. It's like, Right there, the audience has spoken. There it is. Yeah. So uh, what kind of roles do you tend to be drawn to? Um, like, What kind of characters do you prefer playing more than other characters? Or is it a bit of a mix that you enjoy? The ones that pay, number one. <laughs> the, the most one, important. <laughs> the, the one where the check is clearing. That's always <laughs> a good thing for any working actor. We like those jobs. The not, <laughs> not the free jobs, which is what you do a lot of when you're first starting out. Um, but not to be glib or cheeky. Um, honestly, I, I'm one of those working sort of way again, more in the British style, not the American style, which is sort of don't judge the work. Don't question it too much or think, you know, too much about where your career is going. I'm a big believer that work begets work. So whatever the next job is that I can find some interest in and, and, and do my best, usually I get the jobs that I'm supposed to get, if that makes any sense. Yeah. whatever's available to me. So it's just playing a wide range of characters across a wide yeah, range of I like, genres. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm an eclectic. I like always something new and challenging. Um, so as long as it's sort of a variety of things and keeps me guessing and keeps me working a little harder, trying to move my bar, that's that's all I can really hope for. Cool. Uh, the next one's a bit of a self-indulgent one for me. Um, I was a big fan of Power Rangers back in the day and obviously the new film's coming out. And I noticed you were in a film with the Pink Ranger herself, Amy Jo Johnson. I, I was indeed. Yeah. Uh, what was it like working with her? I mean, like post Power Rangers, did that kind of uh, ever I, come up or? Oh yeah. Well, so I was, I was, yeah. So I knew just instinctively not to bug her about any of the Power Rangers. <laughs> right. So we, uh, we got along uh, wonderfully on that set. We had a great time. Uh, we had lots of chemistry uh, she became quite a good mate for a time there. And, um, so I knew I was not, don't bring up the pink costume or any of that <laughs> stuff. It's got all, you know, like she has so many people who are like a bit fetishistic about, you know, her and that costume. I was like, I know just don't touch it. Don't bring it up. If she brings it up, it's fine. So we were, we had, we were going to meet in Boston for I, for some reason we were both passing through Boston and we said, well, let's go for dinner. And, and I was like, okay, well, we had a really nice dinner catching up. I was like, I'll oh, just come back for a drink. We'll have a nightcap at, uh, uh, back at the hotel lobby. Well, little did I know in that hotel where I was staying at was this huge comic and sci-fi convention had no idea. Right. Before, sort of sci-fi and comic conventions were cool. There was this big uh, convention there and she would sort of been resisting. She was sort of trying to get away from pink power ranger stuff, as you can imagine, <laughs> which I was hip to. Um, so I literally brought her into like the lion's den. She, <laughs> what was supposed <laughs> to be just a nice casual night. I was like, Oh my God, you're Amy Jo Johnson. You're the pink power ranger. She's like, where did you bring me? And I was like, I didn't know. I'm so sorry. Like she was, uh, she was very good sport about it, but she was not happy. <laughs> Sometimes your past just catches up with you. Oh, oh man, man alive! But you know what? There, are, you know, the sort of champagne problems, as we say in the industry. Yeah, <laughs> it's a it's a problem when they don't recognize you, isn't it? Well, it, well, it depends <laughs> on how much your ego addicted. I would say that's true. <laughs> right. On the subject of nerdy shows, uh, you've pe appeared on both Charmed and Buffy. Uh, which did. were obviously massive back in the day. Uh, yeah. What was working on those two shows like? Was there any real difference between them? You know, what was the, the atmosphere on one versus the other? And how much sort of interaction did you have with people like the main cast and main producers like Joss Whedon, etc. Um, yeah, off camera? So, yeah, so for, I'll, I'll, I'll do Buffy first. Um, yeah. I didn't, I, the, so what was interesting is I was playing uh, one of the British watchers on that. I just moved to town and so that whole uh, sideline with the vampires was mostly just the, the Brits and the vampire in the house. Uh, 
uh, my episode. So I didn't yeah. really see the main cast or you, you never really see the executive producers or the writers on day to day. You're basically dealing with the uh, episodic director, really. Um, but I did work with a lovely, wonderful, legendary character actor named Harris Eulen, and he was so generous and so kind and so interested. And I really, I really remember it because I it was, I think, my third American credit, and I was a fan of the show, so I was just so happy to be there. And he really just took interest in me and was such a classy guy. I, I, I just remember going, I want to be that in forty years, if that makes <laughs> sense. Yeah, you know, just how to how to pay it forward as another actor to if I'm still fortunate enough to be working in uh, another 20 or 30 years, I want to be that guy on set to a new guy coming in. So that was welcoming and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Welcoming, generous, interested, uh, you know, mentoring me without being uh, patronizing, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, So just very generous, you know, good actor theater type, you know, and then on charmed uh, that was lovely because, uh, I became quite close with Alyssa Milano for a time, and uh, it was just a very welcoming, fun set as well. Just lots of fun frivolity and Shannon Doherty and and uh, and uh, um, her name is uh, Lisa Marie Combs, uh, Holly Marie Combs rather. Holly, Alyssa, and, and Shannon were just so playful and fun, and lots of chemistry there. And and uh, I didn't run into any attitude or any of that stuff. So just really good fun. Yeah. You hear these things about um, some casts are a bit insular when they've been working for a while and then someone comes in and then it's going to be a bit tense, but it doesn't sound like you had that experience with either. Yeah. Show, really. No, not at all. And you know, even if I did, I wouldn't tell you, <laughs> but, <laughs> but in all seriousness, I, I, uh, I, I, you know, I, the, the gossip mill really does sort of, I would say ratchet up, you know, listen, you're working 14, 15 hours a day for nine months with anyone. There's going to be tension on any workplace. I don't care of what course, you're yeah. about, right? But what happens is because everyone's so fascinated by the Hollywood bubble, I think these little leaks and little stories get out and they sort of get a game of telephone and they get amplified. And now the Internet has just taken that amplification and just, like, boosted it. <laughs> yeah, it just gets – it spirals into this person's so a nightmare to work so, with. So, so right now. Yeah. Having said that, I know that there's there's definite horror stories out there of ego and entitlement. Mm-hmm. I'm very blessed that I've not run into an iota of it. Mostly just <laughs> pretty wonderful collaborators, honestly. Uh, so what other TV shows do you enjoy watching, you know, when you have some free time? Is there any particular favorites that are on just now or indeed yeah, um, wrapped up a while ago? I love, I love Black Mirror. Man, I just love what that show is saying and doing. That is just really exciting TV. Um, but going back a bit, um, I really loved Mad Men and I really loved Breaking Bad. Those are all shows. Mm-hmm. I will watch a little bit of everything, but there's not a ton. I don't have a ton of time to like finish shows, if that makes any yeah. sense. So I've, I've also heard that um, uh, what's the net? The Crown is very good. Everyone keeps talking about The Crown. Now, are people watching that in the UK and liking it, or is that an American version of of? Because I've heard that a lot of people are sort of bagging on it over in the UK. Hey, I've never thing? actually watched it, to be honest. Um, yeah. I've heard mixed things myself, you know, as I always hear when it comes to TV shows. But yeah, yeah. It's, it's always interesting. Like Americans love posh. Uh, English entertainment far more than English people do, I have always find, right? Yeah, well, it's about the monarchy and Americans seem to love yeah, the exactly. monarchy. Americans so, yeah, exactly. that sort of celebrity stuff up, whereas, you know, you're all sort of rolling your eyes. <laughs> We've seen it as, all. Yeah. As a Welshman, uh, I know about rolling the eyes at the monarchy. <laughs> yeah, I'll say no more on that one. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Bob Size, as we say. <laughs> so do you have any shows that you have a a burning desire to appear in that are on just now. I know you're in the like the CW oh. bubble at the moment, and they seem to yeah. look after actors passing them back and forth between shows. So, well, seem- well I ho- I only hope that I can be passed around. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, gosh, obviously, uh, I really I really fell in love with Stranger Things this summer. Mm-hmm. I thought that was a really fun, interesting show. Um, but it sort of gets back to my point before. 
Um, until I get a little more, I'm still on the bubble of, as a working class actor, if that makes sense. Yeah. So you you know you you hear these A list actors always talking about choices, right? And it's true. You know, when you get to the top two percent of the ladder as an actor, you have quote unquote choices. Um, but when you're a middle class, upper middle class actor, you know, on the bubble kind of, uh, you know, I'm not a name, I'm not famous, and that's fine with me. That's no problems. Uh, but your your choice is what is your agent sending you out for that week? That's mm-hmm. your choice, and whether you want to go out for it or you don't want to go out for it. And personally, I again, I'm in that journeyman actor category of like. Every job is a good job. It's about my point of view. I need to find the good and bring my best point of view to it. So maybe I'll get picky in 10 years if I'm allowed to. <laughs> but, you know, right now I'm like, you know, who's hiring me? You're my favorite show. <laughs> so if they want you as a villain on The Flash, you'll be a villain on The Flash. If they want you as Which, someone on I'm, Arrow, etc. Exactly. Come on. <laughs> bring it. Yeah. Uh, well, you're in a tiny little indie show called Supernatural. You know, the, yeah. it's only been going 12 years, so I'm counting. Minuscule, so. not global at all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what about Mr. Ketch drew you in in particular? I know you, you said that um, you tend to just see who pays, etc. But um, is there anything yeah. about him that, you know, well, really stands out to you? And yeah. who, has, who is he in your mind? You know? Yeah, so um, he keeps what I what I'm loving about it as an actor is... is uh, is the the onions keeps getting peeled. He gets deeper and more complicated as the episodes go on. So, you know, they keep me in the dark too, to a large degree. There isn't like a show Bible where I'm learning who catch is. I'm sort of yeah. next episode they hire me on because there's all these spoilers and secrecy. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm learning as the audience. I mean, I'm three and a half months ahead, but you know, Every time I get a script or get hired, I you know I don't know if I'm going to die. I don't know what's going to happen. You know, so every time I get a script and I'm still alive at the end of it, I'm like, oh thank God, oh phew, what's going to happen next? So I'm I've got a little bit of a fanboy thing going for the guy myself, just because it's so delicious to play, and I know all these little nuances and things that are coming for the guy. But I mean, who are we kidding? What kid doesn't want to be uh, sort of James Bond growing up, a, yeah. a spy assassin? But even better, a monster assassin. <laughs> so the joke the joke on set was like, you know, this is Monster Bond. You know, he's got mm. toys. He's got great clothes, really great clothes. They give me such amazing clothes. Uh, a Norton Commando motorcycle, which comes full circle to I bought a vampire motorcycle. All oh, right. Uh, which is interesting, right? A Norton Commando. Yeah. Bellwether jackets, Hugo Boss suits, you know. Uh, amazing and uh i get grenade launchers and sniper rifles and i mean you y- if you were a nerd like me growing up <laughs> you're living the dream so yeah. and then to make him sort of a complicating acting challenge on top of all that and nuance and charm but darkness it's just i mean it's they're just it's too much fun i, I mean it really is a, a a dream role so i hope i get to live for a little bit longer yeah i like the uh, the suave sort of public facing side to him and then the uh you know the the morally questionable assassin in the background i always like that dynamic and that was the thing i want i i'm trying to make him so that he'll have a mask a little bit of a different mask in every scene you know like i yeah. actually don't think he's i actually don't believe that he actually is posh like i don't know if they'll ever get into this <laughs> but no but seriously i think he's i think he's working class who's done a bit of a fake posh stance to get where he is himself you know he's completely um working all the angles that way and also you know there's sort of like he presents this sort of butlery posh side and but then i think there's going to be other moments where it gets really dark and animalistic and and i'm really hopefully i can show those multiple sides to the guy hopefully that'll come out the way i'm playing him yeah hopefully see and he certainly had a a few memorable introductions the grenade launcher that you mentioned (laughs) and and that must have been a blast (laughs) <laughs> the jazz was such a great, yeah. great, uh, great thing, and I'm, I'm, I love that a few people caught that I did a, you know, a soccer free kick to punch. <laughs> it. I was like just a little taking the piss, you know, but yeah. you know, a little nod. <laughs> so um, you don't know where you see him going, then essentially, it's just whatever I happens. I, really, next. I, mean, I couldn't even spoil it because yeah. obviously I know a few. I have a few more episodes ahead of you, but mm. you could go. 
so many different directions with him now. Obviously, no, he, you know, just if you know anything about writing and you know story arc, he's going to have to have either a major comeuppance or a major redemption. Yeah. So one of one two. of two ways. <laughs> but if, the, but the longer I think you know the if the if if the audience is enjoying him and you know and honestly this is such an audience driven show yeah. if they respond to the writers they may be able to stretch him out and make him more nuanced and you know complicated because mm-hmm. our complicated characters are what's are so interesting right like getting back to like Breaking Bad for example you know yeah just keeping that moral compass sort of gray and murky and weird and you know, changing alliances. It could be really interesting. So we'll see. It's up to them. Hmm. So on the set of Supernatural, I mean, I've seen a lot of, uh, you know, live tweeting from the set, from uh, Misha and so on. They just seem to have a, a, a good laugh all the time. Is it is it that kind of accurate? And uh, who tends to be sillier and who's more professional, Ab- you know? Absolutely accurate. Well, <laughs> everyone's a total professional. I'll say that. But yeah. at the same time, with a looseness... And, you know, as they say in America, busting balls at all time, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, just this just this real camaraderie that comes from the top, which is Jensen and Jared. And and that's that's true of all shows. The, the, the culture of a show comes from the energy and the, the joie de vivre of the either the executive producers, the lead, the leaders. And on this show, the two leaders are those two guys. And they yeah. are so welcoming so generous, so kind, so funny, uh, so playful. Um, they, uh, they really, they really set the tone and really makes for such a pleasurable work environment. Yeah. Usually when you get to this kind of season 12 or, I mean, nobody ever gets to season 12 really, you know, they lead actors start to get a bit tired and stuff, but they, you know, I don't get that impression. The characters never, appear phoned in which is great and then never and I, I you know i think i think they're acutely aware of how grateful not that they should be but that they are and yeah. these shows that strike lightning like this where lightning in a bottle or the capture of fan base that is so invested and so into the show it, it fuel it really does fuel them and when they do the conventions like they come back just energized and they go you know, I think they know that it's not their show anymore, like in air quotes, mm. that they're vessels of this greater, bigger thing. And so they're just going for the ride and enjoying it so much. And you get you 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 under you can see how much they love it, love their fans and are grateful for where they at because it's an incredible world. I had no idea. I mean, I knew the show, but just again, from watching a few episodes here and there just to get a sense of it. Yeah. But I didn't realize what the SPN family was, and I've been really touched and humbled myself from their outreach. So, you know, hopefully I can uh, play with you guys a little bit longer. Are you a fan of the show yourself? Yeah, I've always been a fan. I've been watching it since day one, you know, and oh, just <laughs> through great. the ups, the downs, the ups again, the downs again, except, you know, as you get with a, a decade and, and more on a TV show. So do you try to do you try to stream it ahead then when the, uh, the Yanks are watching it, or do you have to wait? Um, no, I, I don't wait, but you know, for legal reasons, I shouldn't divulge. Uh, <laughs> okay, I didn't ask that question. <laughs> yeah, um, Delete yeah, it from I'm, your I'm up to date. We never talked about this, okay? We have not talked. I don't. Who are you? Why are we speaking? <laughs> yeah, let's say uh, yeah. I refuse to answer that without my lawyer. <laughs> I plead the fifth for fear of Mr. Ketchik. Come and clean me. Yeah. <laughs> so, is there any kind of? Uh, ridiculous anecdotes that you can think of that you've seen that you could share, you know, because you kind of hear bits and pieces, but hearing it from the, the horse's mouth, so to speak, is always more Yeah, fun. well, Jensen and Jared had absolutely took the piss out of me for uh, my motorcycle helmet because motorcycle helmets are not wardrobe. They are um, they're, they're technically the props department. But right. so what happened, there was a bit of a mismatch in communication and i have a giant welsh head and uh a a really good cranium and um it's seven and five eights hat size and they didn't have a helmet on set that fit me (laughs) so so we we had to sort of cheat the shot of like me coming off the motorcycle and then 
getting the helmet off and it sort of like looked like a little beanie on my head and then we had to sort of cheat camera angles just so my like miss you know good old jupiter over here could get his helmet off <laughs> and then uh so then jared and jensel just were relentless they were just like big head jokes just for the rest of the day and and uh <laughs> uh jensen actually came up and started being uh you know the movie space balls yeah he started just pick, uh, pulling up uh, GIFs and, uh, and uh, you know, JPEGs of Dark Helmet. And he's like, do you think this would fit? How about this? Can we get him this, please? <laughs> <laughs> it was a picture of Dark Helmet and Spaceballs. I was like, uh-huh. okay, guys, you got me. But, you know, again, just we all had a good laugh and <laughs> everyone, you know, just taking the piss and it was great. Yeah, if they're making fun of you, you're part of the family. Oh, yeah. Well, and I'm making fun of myself and, you know, no one <laughs> – you know, everyone takes the work seriously, but not themselves seriously. So yeah. it's lovely. Yeah. That's great. Um, thanks for sharing that. That's a, that's a really good one for anyone who listens to this. And any, um, if anyone who's a fan of Spaceballs. Yeah. <laughs> which, is, you know, which I am. And of course, of course, once we started that, then we all started doing Spaceballs lines, right? So <laughs> it was like, I see your Schwartz is as big as mine. So like, you know, there was a scene where we all have our like, you know, hunting cleaves out. You know, we're like making Schwartz jokes. So it was funny. Our last question is a standard one. Uh, what superpower would you have, and why would you have that power if you could choose one? Flight. Period. Flight. Full stop. Flying around the world, being a bird. Easy. Done. <laughs> that's a that's a good one. You get to <laughs> it save you a lot of money on airfares. Oh, well, just, but yeah, but come on. Yeah, because flying on planes is so fun these days, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, Ryanair. Uh, oh, yeah. sorry, I didn't say that. You can cut that out, too. Um, um, yeah, but just, come on, just being able to, like, run outside your house and have a little hop, skip, and a gallop, and then you're in the air. Give me a break. Get into a tree, go into a mountain. Forget it. It's perfect. <laughs> I'm scared of heights, so it wouldn't be my oh. ideal. Oh, well, there you go. See, <laughs> each to their own, right? Yeah, yeah, everyone's different. But anyway, uh, thanks very much for coming on. It's great to talk to someone who's in one of my favorite shows. And uh, hopefully your role will be significant in the future episodes and we'll see more of Mr. Ketch because I think everybody would agree he's an interesting character. Oh, well, good. All right, well, it's absolutely my pleasure, Craig, and thanks for reaching out and thanks for your interest. Uh, no you problem. know, the show truly is uh, now made by fans like you, so... Uh, if uh, you like where Catch is going, it's in the power of your guys' hands, too. So let them know. <laughs> Will do. Okay. All Thank right, you man. very much. All right. Take care, mate. Thanks for your call, all right? And thanks for coming on. You bet. Bye-bye. That was my interview with Supernatural's Mr. Ketch himself, David Hayden Jones. I thank him for his time and for being such a trooper when there were connection issues. I think you'll all agree that he had a lot of great stuff to share and I hope you'll join me in wishing him all the best for the future. As always, if you like what you heard, you can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube or any major podcasting app. And I hope you'll join us on the next Deal Before Pod. Carry on my wayward There'll be peace when Cry.